Hello, everyone, and welcome to my session titled, The World is Your User Agent, Why Semantic HTML is Important for Accessibility. My name is Rachel Cherry. My pronouns are she, her. I am in my mid-30s, starting to creep into my late 30s. I have pale white skin and long curly auburn hair. I wear glasses when I'm on my computer. I love to run and spend time exploring my new city. I just moved to Rochester, New York. That's why my office is kind of blank and empty. Uh, I love to eat delicious tacos. I run so I can eat delicious tacos. <laughs> so that's a little bit about me. I'm a, a freelance software engineer and web accessibility specialist. I've been working in the web space for around 15 years. I've worked a lot in higher education and on enterprise level platforms. I'm the director and founder of WP Campus, which is a community focused on using WordPress and higher ed. You might remember us as the group who commissioned the accessibility audit of Gutenberg, WordPress's not so newish anymore block editor. I'm also the director of technology and design for Equal Made, an organization I co-founded with my amazing partner and friend, Sarah Clark. We have a goal to improve web accessibility by providing accessible, equitable, and sustainable software and services. Like a lot of web developers I taught myself, I have a bachelor's degree in graphic design, a skill I don't really use directly anymore, but having an eye for design does help in my field of front-end web development. My first introduction to web accessibility was actually a summer term class I took in college. It was one of my very first and pretty much only few web focused classes at my university. It was a class about section 508. But my true education came when I started working in higher ed where a lot of what we do in higher ed actually has to be accessible by law. Note the recently mentioned section 508. This is one reason why it's nice to work in higher ed because organizations are much more likely to care about web accessibility and enforce it, even if they're only enforcing it for legal reasons. The web is such a fun place to work. I really enjoyed my career. I've dedicated a large portion of my career to web accessibility. And for the good and the bad, web technology changes constantly and rapidly, and it's exciting to learn new things. And the only way to stay on top of things is to be constantly learning and adapting. There we go. Uh, but HTML hasn't changed that much. HTML5, the current version, was released back in 2014. And yes, nowadays we have all kinds of complex JavaScript frameworks and static site generators and numerous programming languages and compilers. But in the end, they all create HTML. HTML is the foundation of the web that we all work on. It is the language that binds us all together. HTML is the language you use if you do want to communicate on the web, which is why accessible HTML is so vital in order to foster an accessible web and to provide equal access to an internet that everyone should be able to access and where everyone can participate. So I have several goals for today's discussion. There's HTML and there's something called semantic HTML. And today I want to talk about semantic HTML. More importantly, I want to talk about why it's so important to write semantic HTML in order to create accessible websites. I want to encourage developers to focus on writing semantic HTML that is abstracted from CSS or the visual layer of the web. HTML is supposed to be written for computers to interpret and not our eyeballs. I want to help developers better understand that HTML should be written to indicate what your content means rather than how it should be displayed in the browser. And most importantly, to help developers understand that HTML that actually HTML and semantic HTML 
should be the same thing because semantic HTML is actually just another way of saying using HTML correctly or using HTML as it's intended. As a web accessibility specialist, I've seen my fair share of inaccessible websites. The general state of the web and web accessibility is getting better, but it's still pretty bad. And almost all of these websites are inaccessible because of non-semantic HTML. We work on a platform that is quite malleable. It is very easy to manipulate HTML so that it, quote, works for you, end quote, and how you use technology. But everyone uses technology differently. And if you want to create accessible websites, you need to write HTML that works for everyone and not just you. So how do you write HTML that works for everyone? You write semantic HTML. So let's start with some terminology. Terminology is so important to ensure we all have the same understanding and that we're all on the same page. The topics I'm going to discuss play a vital role in understanding HTML. And the more you understand HTML, the more likely it is you will use it correctly. And as we've said, when your HTML is valid and correctly used, it is way more likely to be accessible. So what is a user agent? It is part of my session title, so it must be important. They are very important. A user agent is any software that retrieves, renders, and facilitates end user action, excuse me, end user interaction with web content or whose user interface is implemented using web technologies. That is the literal definition from the W3C. A user agent basically is software that retrieves your HTML and works to interpret your HTML in order to facilitate interaction between your HTML and the end user. Some prominent examples of user agents are web browsers. That's a really common one, right? or email clients, even smart assistant devices like Google Home or Alexa or Siri or phone apps or smart TVs or Apple Watches. There's a neat database you can use to search for all the different user agents. They even have their own accessibility guidelines. User, they're called User Agent Accessibility Guidelines, UAAG. We all have our acronyms, don't we? The important thing to remember about user agents is that they are responsible for interpreting your HTML and facilitating the end user action. I keep saying action instead of interaction, I'm sorry. And the end user interaction with your content. So it is vital to understand that user agents, sorry, it is vital that user agents understand the experience you are trying to provide. It is vital that user agents understand what you are trying to communicate so that they can correctly interpret and convey your content to the end user. It is also important to understand that user agents provide a wide variety of interfaces for a wide variety of users who use technology differently. Let's go back to our list. Web browsers provide a visual interface to sighted users while also interpreting HTML for screen readers and other assistive computer tech. Some have a physical or visual interface, others do not. Some are voice activated. We are surrounded by user agents always talking to the web. As we continue our discussion, we will better understand why they are in such an important part and why writing semantic HTML that can be understood by user agents is so important for web accessibility. So what are semantics? More terminology. This might be the only piece of terminology that isn't technical jargon. Semantics represent the meaning and interpretation of words, signs, and sentence structure. Semantics are very important in language because the semantics of your words literally represent what your words mean and how your words are interpreted. Once you have a handle on the words themselves, then context comes into play. 
the same word can be said to two people and they can interpret them differently. For example, the word crash can mean many things. It can mean an auto accident, the stock market dropped, you attended a party without being invited, you're at the beach and ocean waves are hitting the shore. Semantics and context are important and without them, communication can be a struggle. We wouldn't understand each other very well. We wouldn't be able to correctly interpret what each other is trying to say or the point someone is trying to make. Without context and meaning in communication, well, it's pretty much like communicating with strangers over social media all the time. So what is HTML? Well, I assume most of us are quite familiar with, with this term, but we're gonna take a little bit of a dive or a deep dive. HTML or hypertext markup language is the standard markup language used for documents when you wanna share that document over the internet. HTML is very much a language, no matter what some tech bro might tell you. There are lots of ways to communicate over the internet, but HTML is the language you would use if you wanted to communicate in a document format. When we say documents, we basically mean the format you create when you use Google Docs or Microsoft Word or some similar software. HTML follows a document model and is the language you would use when you wanna share that document over the internet. Now let's break down the definition of HTML even further and discuss markup language. A markup language is a computer language that uses tags inserted in a text document to control its structure, formatting, or the relationship between its parts. Markup language is human readable, which means markup files contain standard words rather than typical programming syntax. These tags used in markup language exist to give meaning to the content in your document, or as we've discussed, they give semantics. And to help cover a wide variety of content for the web, there are over a hundred HTML tags you can use. When I was creating the slide, I just started copying and pasting and typing in HTML tag names from memory. It was like a game. I felt like I was at a web developers conference playing a game. How many HTML tags can you remember? Um, I eventually got a little bit of help from some random website. But all of these tags exist for a reason. They each have their own meaning and some even have their own functionality and interactivity. Some of these tags are for content sectioning, like the main tag and the footer tag, the nav, the aside, the header. Some tags are for organizing text content, like the ordered list and the unordered list and the block quote. And on and on and on. Again, there are over a hundred HTML tags and I'm not going to read them all out to you. But I do wonder what is your favorite HTML tag? And have you ever thought about its role in the document model and what it means? So now let's mesh together what we've learned about markup languages with our definition of HTML. HTML is a markup language that uses tags to define the structure, formatting, and the relationships of a document in order to communicate a document's meaning and context over the internet. These tags are the tags we use every time we write HTML, the tags that we just discussed. These tags are what give meaning or semantics to our content in order to publish our content and make that content accessible over the internet. Let's do a quick document example. This is a extremely basic example of HTML markup language tags in action. Uh, there can only fit so much code on a slide. So again, very basic. Anyone can just dump a bunch of text in a document, but without formatting and structure and relationships, our documents would lack meaning and context. 
two characteristics, as we've discussed, that are vital for understanding. Um, so let's pretend we've created a basic document in Google Docs, and now we want to publish it on the internet. So we need HTML. Here's our basic document with an image of my new city that I hope the University of Rochester doesn't mind me using. Right now, this is basic text with very little meaning. Yes, I could read this text and take a guess at its structure, but the right HTML would allow me to best understand its intended structure and meaning. Let's get this ready for the internet. Our document needs an H1. Let's see, we have blocks of text for paragraphs. Breaking my content into sections with subheadings allows for easier readability and navigation. Here we have a list of content items. I meant to make those content items also links and I totally forgot, I apologize. But we could wrap the George Eastman Museum and the Strong National Museum of Play inside of A tags and link users to their websites for more information. And we want to include an image. I apologize profusely for my terrible and vague alt description of this image, but there is only so much room on the slide. Please be sure to attend any and all AxCon sessions on how to write accessible alt descriptions because this is clearly not a good example. Also, for those of you who don't know, here's a little extra HTML terminology. We've been talking a lot about tags. The, the H1 is an HTML tag, but the combination of the start tag and the end tag wrapped around the text is an H1 HTML element. So this is the difference when we talk about tags versus elements. So we've discussed semantics, HTML, and markup language. And hopefully you are beginning to see all of the relationships. So now we can discuss what is semantic HTML. Semantic HTML is well-written standards compliant HTML markup that uses proper HTML tags to convey the intended meaning of a document. Developers that write semantic HTML understand the language. They have read the HTML spec. They understand which tags should be used in order to convey specific meaning and functionality, and they use those tags correctly to convey that meaning. For example, they use a button tag when it's proper to use a button tag. They use a link tag when it's proper to use a link tag, et cetera, et cetera. So why isn't all HTML semantic? Why is it important that we discuss semantic HTML specifically? So let's dive into an example of semantic versus non-semantic HTML. It's obviously, again, challenging to put a lot of code on the slide. So this is a very, very basic example. As many of us know, you can write non-semantic HTML that will come across in a web browser. You can write non-semantic HTML that can be read by screen readers. To our benefit and detriment, web browsers are extremely flexible. This HTML on the left side of my screen can be made usable in a web browser. You could style these divs with CSS and make them look like headings. You can add JavaScript to make this span element behave like a button. And this experience might work for a visual user who can use a mouse to click on the span, but this HTML is non-semantic and it uses, which means it uses the wrong tags to convey the meaning and the functionality it's trying to provide. So technology may not understand the intent of this HTML. And if technology doesn't understand what you're trying to communicate, that's when content becomes inaccessible. That span should be a button. And then technology would know how to make that button interactive for users. 
That first div should be an H1 or an H2, depending on the document model. That second div should be broken into paragraphs. The non-semantic HTML is not using the correct HTML tags that would provide the best meaning and functionality for the user. This is also an example of something I call presentational HTML or presentation focused HTML. These are terms I use to describe when HTML markup is less focused on semantics and more focused on how the HTML will be presented visually in the browser by using and manipulating HTML with CSS and or JavaScript. And CSS is a wonderful tool. It provides so much flexibility and creativity. It becomes so advanced. It has become so advanced. It's a lot of fun to work with. I enjoy it. Nothing wrong with CSS. But CSS is a visual communication tool. The next time you sit down and, and interact with your website, or you sit down to design a new website, think about how much of your context is placed inside of your visual design. For example, when you make text bigger and you place it off to the side and you put a bunch of spacing around it, you're providing context. You're highlighting that text visually and giving it meaning and separation. But are you only giving that meaning via CSS? When you place event listings on your website and you place calendar icons next to the text, for visual users, these icons provide context and tell the users, oh, that's an event. But do you provide that same context in your HTML? As soon as you begin to work with CSS and begin to create visual structures and layouts and, and you change CSS defaults, you begin to create new context and meaning but only for your visual users. More often than not, this approach also runs the risk of removing context altogether for non-visual users. For example, did you know that if you add display none to an element via CSS, it removes that element from the document model and hides that element for screen readers, hides it from screen readers. Sometimes this is what you intend to do, but not always. It is important that we consider the context we place in our CSS and visual design, and we consider whether or not that same context is provided via HTML for those who don't consume our content visually. There's a good chance we've all published presentation-focused HTML at some point in our developer journey, especially if, like myself, you are self-taught. We are all learning every day. I am learning every day. And I've been doing this for 15 years. But I do want develop developers to better understand that HTML should be written to indicate what your content means and not how it should be displayed in the browser. We work on a platform that is quite malleable. I've said this before and I'll say it again. It is very easy to manipulate HTML so that it works for you and how you use technology but everyone uses technology differently. If you wanna create accessible websites, you need to write HTML that works for everyone. And remember that you are not writing HTML for human or visual consumption. You are writing HTML to communicate with user agents. You write CSS to communicate with visual users. So why is semantic and non-presentational HTML so important? Why is non-semantic HTML inaccessible? Well, there are technical and non-technical reasons. For starters, everyone uses technology differently. I've said this several times now, it's super important. I can use a mouse, but I prefer to use a keyboard. I have tendinitis in my dominant wrist from years of using non-ergonomic mice. And the keyboard usage helps reduce my discomfort. Using the keyboard's faster. I'm sighted and I can hear relatively well, but I don't like to watch videos without captions because captions help me better understand all the words. But I am privileged. I can use a mouse if I need to. I can watch a video without captions and understand the large majority of what's being said. 
I can interpret visual and, uh, and audible meaning. You're attending this conference, which means maybe you now understand how others might use technology differently from you, how not everyone can interpret visual or audible meaning. Maybe someone needs a screen reader or a text reader. Maybe they need to use a head pointer or a single switch entry device. And now user agents are coming back into our discussion because HTML needs to be interpreted by a wide variety of technologies and user agents in order to provide content to these wide variety of users and the various technologies and user agents that they are using. So how do you make sure your HTML can be interpreted by as many user agents as possible? Well, it turns out that HTML has rules and standards. HTML even has governance. And these rules exist for everyone, for every user agent that consumes your document, and it should exist for every developer. There is an agreement between HTML and the technologies interpreting HTML that if specific tags are used, they are meant to convey a specific meaning or implement a specific functionality. And then it's the technology's responsibility to convey that meaning and provide that functionality to the end user. And as we've discussed, browsers will let you break these rules. We deal with this all the time. I feel like it's my job security sometimes. <laughs> but when you, as a developer, break the rules of HTML and you use invalid tags, you're much more likely to create inaccessible content because the technology interpreting your HTML may not always understand your meaning and might represent your content incorrectly or might not represent your content at all. This is why these rules and these standards and the HTML spec are so important for the health of our platform and the accessibility of its content. They create boundaries and structures that everyone can work within and so that all technology can do its best to interpret what we are trying to communicate. So let's review before we move on to the last chapter of my discussion. I do think it's important to review what we've discussed. I apologize, these couple slides are a little bit wordy. I will take it slow. Semantics represent what your content means and how it should be interpreted to the end user. HTML is a markup language that uses tags to provide semantics or give meaning to your content. And when HTML is used correctly, your content has its proper and intended meaning. A user agent is software that retrieves your HTML and works to interpret your HTML in order to facilitate interaction with the end user. For example, a web browser would retrieve your HTML and display it inside of the web browser. Users might consume the web browser content visually, or they might use assistive tech like a screen reader or a pointer. Remember that everyone uses technology differently, so user agents do not always provide a visual interface. User agents need to understand your meaning without visual context. So I had a little subtitle there I totally forgot about. Remember, HTML tags are meant to be consumed by a computer and not humans. HTML has rules and standards that define how your HTML should be interpreted by a user agent. Therefore, it is vital to write semantic standards compliant HTML so that users can best understand your content 
and its meaning. Help user agents help you. And lastly, when user agents understand, they can better interpret your content and know how to make it accessible to the end user through, ever, through whichever manner they perform. In other words, if a screen reader understands what you're trying to communicate and the functionality you're trying to provide because you follow the standards and we're all speaking the same language, they can better interpret your content to users who rely on assistive technology like screen readers. If a single switch device understands your con content has buttons and other interactive elements on your page, then that technology can better interpret your functionality to users who rely on that technology. HTML rules and standards exist so that humans can better communicate with computers and computers can better communicate with other humans. Validate semantic HTML that follows standards is how you create accessible content. To kind of, to kind of close that full circle, please study the HTML spec. This is only a 40 minute lecture. I have barely scratched the surface of a lot of HTML elements. There are over a hundred elements, as I said, and they all provide different meaning and different functionality. The best thing you can do as a front end dev is to study the HTML spec. I understand it's a long document filled with lots of technical jargon, but the more you read it, the easier it will be to understand. And even if you never fully understand the document, Every time you read it, you will learn something. Trying to understand HTML standards will not be a waste of your time. So we dive into the last section. What if HTML doesn't provide the semantics I need? Great question. And uh, I know that I'm, I'm running out of time a little bit, so I'm gonna quickly move through my last section, maybe a little quicker, quicker than intended. Um, I, the best way to answer, you know, how do you get semantics in HTML that you need um, or that HTML doesn't provide is to cover a little history. HTML was released in 1993. The first HTML websites were usually quite accessible because content back then was also usually quite basic. Then we decided we wanted our websites to be a little more dynamic and we introduced JavaScript in 1995. In 1997, we decided that assistive devices needed more information from websites and the first accessibility API was introduced. If you haven't read much about accessibility APIs, definitely go check it out. So we get into the 2000s and we increasingly make the web more complicated. Websites become much more dynamic. Single page applications are introduced like React and Vue. Content is changing on the fly, moving all over the screen. Web pages are just constantly updating with different information. So how does HTML keep up? We have created an information gap between the semantics that HTML markup can provide and what developers and users need in a more complex web environment. Oops. And then ARIA was introduced. So to answer our previous question, what if HTML doesn't provide the semantics you need, then ARIA is the solution to your problem. And maybe you have or haven't heard of ARIA, maybe you've never really understood what it is. I hope that this helps. So what is ARIA? It stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And ARIA are HTML attributes that were introduced that help to add meaning and context to HTML markup that default HTML cannot provide or does not provide. ARIA was created because there were limitations with HTML when it came to providing more complex meaning, especially when it came to screen readers. There weren't tags that might represent more complex uh, elements like tab lists or menu items or list items. There weren't HTML tags to represent tooltips and switches. 
ARIA was introduced to provide this missing semantic meaning uh, so that we can provide more complex content that is accessible to users, specifically screen readers. So how does ARIA add this meaning? It defines semantics that can be applied to elements, which are divided into two categories. Roles, which define a type of user face and element. Basically adding a role to an HTML tag is like creating a new HTML tag. Roles provide meaning just as tags provide meaning. The other category states and properties are values you can provide, which are supported by one of these roles or by an HTML tag. So let's talk about roles. I think it's important to repeat that adding a role to a tag is basically like creating a new tag. By default, many HTML tags come with implicit, implicit ARIA roles. In other words, you don't have to add them. They're already there. For example, an A tag has a role of a link, and a side has a role of complementary. An ordered list has a role of a list. Where you do have to manually add ARIA roles is when we don't have an HTML tag that comes implicitly defined with the role you need. For example, a tab list, a switch, or a menu item. ARIA provides these roles for us. Let's cover a quick example of ARIA and how to add roles. What's not shown here is all the CSS involved to take this markup and make it look like a progress bar. But as we've discussed, when you make content that is purely visual, and when you create content that only exists inside CSS, you're only providing context for sighted users. So this progress bar is inaccessible to everyone else. Let's look at this progress bar markup with ARIA. With ARIA, we have access to an ARIA role of progress bar, which gives the user interface more meaning in order to interpret that element to the end user. You have properties which give valuable information for the role. In this example, value now and value min and value max. And now the technology that is interpreting your HTML, whether it's a browser or a screen reader, has so much more meaning and can take this information and provide a higher quality, more accessible experience. Before, without ARIA, your content only had meaning for sighted users because of CSS. And now with ARIA, your content has meaning for everyone. Remember, HTML is talking to a computer so that the computer can interpret your content correctly to the end user. The more semantic information you can give the computer, the more it can correctly interpret what it is you are trying to create. And remember how I talked about lessons learned? I'm always learning. I pulled this progress example, progress bar example markup from an older presentation. I've always felt like this progress bar example was a great and clear example to help illustrate ARIA and how it works. And it's still a great example, but I learned recently there's actually an HTML tag that has the implicit meaning of a progress bar. It's the progress tag. And here is the proper markup you would use for that tag. Uh, here's a more common ARIA example. You don't need an ARIA role in this instance because the role of this HTML tag is already defined. A tags have a role of link. ARIA label is an ARIA property you can provide, which is supported by the A tag and link role and allows you to provide a more contextual label for this link. So why would you need to provide more context for this link? Well, let's pretend that this is on a web page. And for those of us who are cited, we can imagine this link is surrounded by some text about accessibility. There's a heading above the link that reads accessibility. And so when we see the learn more link, as a visual consumer of this information, we have the context we need to know that this is a learn more link and it means I'm going to learn more about accessibility. But if you are not consuming this information from a visual format, then you would not have that same context. You just have a link that says learn more and you have no idea what you're learning more about. The ARIA label gives more context to the computer and the computer provides that context to screen readers. It's also important to understand when not to use ARIA. You only need to use ARIA when HTML alone does not provide the meaning that you need. 
I, I know we are running a little low on time, so I'm going to skip over my next section and skip over I, where I just kind of give an example of when to not use ARIA. So we'll skip over that. Please study the ARIA spec. It's very important. Let me find my... Um, it is the second best thing you can do as a front-end developer. Again, it's a long document filled with jargon. I especially recommend visiting the document conformance requirements for the use of ARIA attributes in HTML section because it is a super helpful section that provides a whole table of elements, their implicit ARIA semantics, in other words, their corresponding roles, and any ARIA roles, states, and properties which may be used. Definitely grab a screenshot of that. Definitely find that table. It's super helpful. Um, so we'll skip over our review. Remember that ARI is your friend in trying to give more semantic information to computers. Use it wisely, use it correctly. And there you have it. We have reached the end of my discussion. Um, here are a few takeaways, please. Again, it's so important to study the spec. I encourage everyone to install and use the accessibility API in your browser dev tools. Please always remember that everyone uses technology differently from you and what works for you will not necessarily work for others. And that the purpose of HTML is not is to talk to a computer and do not rely on visual CSS to communicate what you mean. Thank you. Thank you for all your time. Thank you for joining me here today. You can follow me on Twitter, Bama Designer, or visit my website, bamadesigner.com and subscribe. And I will hand it back over to Travis. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, we, ha we have a lot of questions and not a lot of time to get into them. Um, first and foremost, there's been a lot of people asking for access to the slide deck. Um, and I've kind of told I don't think we can hear questions. you, Travis. We got some good ones. Uh, can anyone let me know if my audio is working? It's back. OK, we're going into emergency mode. This might not sound as good. Sorry about that. Um, headset gave up. It's been a long day. So are you ready for some questions, Rachel? We got some good ones. Yes, lay it on me. Yeah. All right, so the most popular question is for folks who say, I can get the same effect of semantic HTML with ARIA, what do you say to get them to buy into using semantic HTML? So they say they can still get the same semantics with ARIA. What is the argument to try to use default HTML instead? I think that's the spirit of it, yeah. It's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll fall back on the idea of making sure our HTML, HTML is the base. And so if we think about ARIA, ARIA was invented uh, mostly for screen readers, if not solely for screen readers. Um, and so if you can provide the meaning within the HTML, um, this will be better in the long run and in the kind of more global way to think about the web um, because you are making the base of your code of your HTML accessible. And so therefore it's gonna be more likely to be accessible to other assistive devices versus maybe only being accessible within a screen reader. And because screen readers also follow HTML standards, if you're able to have those semantics defined within HTML, then the screen readers will also, will be able to understand both. Awesome, yeah, I think that's a great answer. I wish I was allowed to participate in it as a panel because I have opinions too. I thought that was a great answer. Um, I'm gonna just jump around through these. Uh, this is an interesting one. Do you have any specific training courses or articles that you would suggest for web developers to use to, to um, in order to better understand and use semantic HTML? Um, I apologize. The you mentioned. Okay. Um, I apologize being on the spot. I, I don't, uh, but maybe ping me on Twitter or something tomorrow and I will 
I'll do some looking around and dig up a few things. You're going to get a lot of pings on Twitter tomorrow. <laughs> Wait till tomorrow. I'm taking a break tonight. <laughs> and you and you did you did reference the spec, which I think was great advice throughout your talk. So that that's one way to start, but it can be a little um, long to, to dive into. It can be a lot. It can be a lot. Um, it it takes time. It takes reading it frequently. It takes implementing and trial and error and testing. I mean. You're you're gonna get it wrong sometimes, and but you just you keep coming back to it. You keep learning. You take something away every time. So here is oops, uh, I'm seeing questions come in that I didn't see yet. Um, here's one that I I liked. It says, so would you say that you should only add aria roles on div elements since the other tags already have roles associated? Well, it depends. It depends on the role. Uh, a div by default, or a div implicitly does not have any roles from my recollection. Um, and so a div is a pretty flexible element, as we all know, to kind of throw at it what you need it to do. And so it's much more likely that you'll be able to add a role to a div uh, and not kind of break any default functionality than it than it is if you add a role to say a button that has implied meaning already. And if you imply, if you add another role to a button, then you risk the chance of stripping that default meaning or conflicting with it, basically breaking it. It's really confusing, it's confused. Um, so yeah, um, it, de it really depends on the role, but you are more likely to not break something on a div than versus another element that has a role already. Okay. Um, let's see what else we have here. What what tools would you recommend to test um, auto, automated or manual to double check our code for semantic HTML? There's a wide variety of tools. Um, I mean, DQ has one. Um, the Axe Dev Tools is a great tool. I pay for the, the premium tool. It's a great tool to have in my belt. Um, the Accessibility API is really neat. It's not an automated tool, for example, but Google Chrome and Firefox, um, from what, at least from what I know of, there could be more, but at least those two browsers allow you to access the Accessibility API in your Dev Tools which I find really helpful because I'm always got the dev tools open. And basically it provides this tree of, of meaning that the, the API has pulled from your content. So you can navigate and traverse through that tree and see if the meaning you gave to something came across correctly. And so that's a great tool, recommend keeping that. Um, Again, if you ping me on Twitter tomorrow, I, I, I have lists somewhere <laughs> that I can share, but there are tons of tools that you can implement that will do this automatically or in an automated fashion as well. All right, and we're almost out of time. And I, I, this question is popular. I saved it till the end because it's gonna probably spark a debate um, and it might go to Twitter, um, but it's a good question. Um, it's from Jacob, it says, do you think a modal should begin with an H1, kind of like it's it's its own page, or an H2 because it's below the parent page in the DOM? I have seen debates about this. It's a great question, and it's something that I recently worked on because I personally would like to test it more. From my reading and research, um, or some of the some of the reading I've come across, I've implied that that modals if they are actually treated like dialogues. Um, so there's, there's, there's the design pattern of a modal, which is just to kind of put up a box on the screen, dim the background and, um, and highlight some text and that you could call it a modal, but there's a, there's a difference between the design pattern and actually implementing a dialogue, which is an HTML role. And so from some of my reading, it's implied that you should treat actual dialogues like a new document. And so in that case, you know, um, common sense of HTML would imply that it needs an H1. Um, so 
I am not an expert on this very specific particular usage. Um, if you find some reading or some testing, please share it with me because I currently am working on creating you know, some accessible dialogues and such, and it's something that I am super intrigued by. Um, I know that was not a super specific, hardcore, concrete answer, but I hope it's going to have a away. busy day on Twitter tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> wait till tomorrow. Um, yeah, and with that, everyone, if I, we didn't get to your question, I'm sorry, we are out of time. Um, thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you to all our, our attendees. Um, please come back tomorrow for the rest of AxCon and Thursday. And with that, we'll close yeah. it out. Thank you. Thanks.